Well, good evening, everyone. Those who are visitors, my name's Simon, one of the ministers here. And uh, what a delight to be sharing with you this evening. And throughout August, in the mornings and the evening service, we're going to be looking at psalms. And the preacher gets to preach from their favorite psalm. And uh, this evening, we're in Psalm 46, because it's one of my favorites. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are a speaking God and we pray you'd speak to us this evening. And thank you that you are a meeting God and we pray that you would meet with us this evening. And we thank you, Lord. Amen. In the classic English technical text on philosophy, Wind in the Willows, it begins like this. So this is a river, asks Mole. The river, corrected the rat. And you really live by the river? What a jolly life. By it and with it and on it and in it, said the rat its brother and sister to me, and aunts and company and food and drink and washing. It's my world and I don't want any other. What it hasn't got is not worth having and what it doesn't know is not worth knowing. Boy, the times we've had together. And the psalmist celebrating the goodness of God in. Psalm 46 says, verse four of that psalm, there is a river. There is a river whose streams make glad, bring joy to the city of God, to the people of God. And like the rat on his river, as those who are offered God's river, who are invited into God's river, we are to be those who live by it and with it and on it and in it. God's people are called to be river people. River is a constant metaphor uh, that God employs in the Bible to describe and to depict our life with him and our work in our world. And that river is to frame our lives. The Bible, right at the beginning, God creates a river. There is the head of the river in Eden. Want a pub, like our head of the river. But there was this head of the river that broke up into different rivers in Eden. And the Bible ends in paradise, again, speaking of a river. In Ezekiel 47, the prophet is given a vision of eternity, of glory, of the temple in God's eternal reign. And from the altar flows a river. And the pilgrimage is not of the people of God to the city of God, the pilgrimage is of God, from the city of God, going out and bringing transformation. And wherever that river flows, it changes things for the good. It brings transformation to the deserts. It brings transformation to the stagnant marshes. It brings industry. Uh, there's fishermen. It brings beautiful crops growing along the side of the river. It's just a beautiful image of what God's river does. And that river that flows from the altar, that flows from the sacrifice, that flows from God in Christ Jesus is a river that changes our lives, that satisfies our lives, that purifies our lives, that brings an end to the desert in our lives, that brings an end to the marsh and the stagnation in our lives, that brings beauty. And the prophet in Ezekiel 47 is invited to get in the river. Not just to look at the river, not just to paddle in the river, not just to have the river splash on him, but to get stuck in. And he's called to go in and he goes in. In his... 
We'll try again. He goes in up to his ankles, and then he goes up to his knees, then he goes up to his waist, and then he goes in over his head. And God is inviting us to go in over our heads with him into his life-giving river. Where are you in the river? Are you on the edge watching others in there? Or are you just dipping your toe in? Or are you just paddling in it? It's a river, not a paddling pool. And it's flowing, it ain't a pond. And we're called, we're invited, we're beckoned by God to get in the river and to be transformed by it. C.S. Lewis in The Last Battle picks up this image of God's blessing as a river and he depicts the, the Christians, the believers, the saints who are being invited to go and he uses this little phrase repeatedly, further up and further in. Further up and further in. Some of you have been holding back. Some of you have just stayed where you are as the river has kept going. But this summer God is inviting you come further up and further in to all the goodness and blessing and life and purpose and transformation that I have for you. So it's a picture, but what is it a picture of this river? Well, some think it's a, a literal river uh, in the millennial temple. It may, it may not be. But uh, certainly it represents the Holy Spirit. That's what the long and strong tradition of the church has seen. That it represents the outgoing, giving God. The Holy Spirit is God flowing out to us with all his blessings. The Puritan John Owen said that it was the mission of the church. I think that's part of it, although I would suggest the mission of the church is actually carried by the river. My favorite description of it is that it is the royal graces. It is the divine, heavenly, kingly, godly blessings carried and conveyed by the Spirit from the side of the altar, from the sacrifice of Jesus coming out to us to transform our lives. And our lives need transforming, don't they? I mean, there are desert places in our lives. There are arid, barren, wilderness places there. There's bog. There's places that just ain't right. Perhaps smell a bit. And God wants to send his river. He wants to send it this evening to change us and transform us. The prophet Isaiah talked about the river. And in Isaiah 43, 19, he does it a few times. But there he talks about this river that causes the desert to break out into bloom. Out into blossom. Maybe you feel just really dry. Like a dead place in your soul. Well, it is miraculous, but actually happens in the natural. When the rains come, the spring, uh, the, the autumn rains, the desert can be transformed just overnight. And all those seeds can rapidly break out and flowers can bloom in the desert and it can happen in your life. I'm just gonna see if I can adjust this. If not, I'll take a handheld. Is that all right? The psalmist called it a river of delights. And I love what Job says. He said it's a river of honey and cream. It's just a river of all those good things. The river is the work of the spirit outgoing from God, coming to us to bring change. But that river flows from Jesus. He is the headwater. In John chapter four, we read of an extraordinary encounter that Jesus had with a woman, a Samaritan woman at a well. It appears she's had an eye, eyebrow raising past. 
And they get to Samaria. It's amazing that they're in Samaria because Jews never went to Samaria. They were regarded as the enemy. In fact, they were regarded worse than the Roman occupiers because they were um, compromised Jewish people who had intermarried with the pagans. And that was seen as worse than being a pagan. And Jesus goes to Samaria, an extraordinary thing. And then weary, he knows of what we're made. He sits down at the well and there's a woman and it's lunchtime and she's drawing water. This is strange. Normally you draw water in the morning and it's even stranger because a mile and a half away in the town is the well. So why is she outside the town at lunchtime in the heat of the day getting the water? Well, it would seem that she's not welcome at the well by the other women collecting their daily water. And we later find out that she's had five husbands and now she's living with a different bloke and she's got a bit of a reputation. She's got a bit of a past. We don't know what that is, but maybe that's in the story. But here, in an extraordinary way, Jesus breaks down this cultural barrier of Jew and Samaritan, this cultural barrier. Men never introduced themselves and spoke to women in that way, a random stranger. And she's drawing water and Jesus says, can I have a drink? Jesus wants something from her. What does Jesus want from you? And then she says, what? You're talking to me, you're a bloke talking to me, you're a Jew talking to me, what's going on? And Jesus, oh, he says, if only you knew, if only you understood who it was who is asking this of you, you'd ask him, me, and I'd give you a drink and you'd drink it and you'd never thirst again. Jesus is always wanting to give us something that will change our lives. He wants to give us from himself. He wants to give us his spirit and he doesn't want us ever to be thirsty or needy or empty again. And he says this water that I give will well up to eternal life. And she'd been thirsty all her life. She'd been needy all her life. But Jesus sees past her past. He sees past her present. And he sees her future. And he wants her to have a future with him. With God within her. Flowing out and bringing life. A similar promise Jesus makes a bit later, John 7, 37. In a very powerful and prophetic context, it's the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, where once a year the Jewish people went on pilgrimage up to Jerusalem and they built these tabernacles, these booths, these kind of dwellings out of branches, and they remembered that they were a pilgrim people. But on every single day of the Feast of Booths, Um, a priest would take a golden flagon and he'd go down to the pool of Siloam. Anyone been there? Listen, if you can, you've got to make a visit. It's a wonderful place. Jerusalem, pool of Siloam. And he goes and the priest gets this water and there's a whole gathering around him. They're all celebrating. And the priest goes back up to the temple and he goes to the altar And beside the altar, there is a vase and he pours the water in. And as he does it, it was prophetic. The rabbi said that it was a symbol of the Holy Spirit that they prayed would one day come. And they were thanking God for the provision of water you needed in the hot Middle East. And there on the last day, as the priest prophetically pours out the water and everyone's thanking God for rain, thanking God for the water and praying that the water symbolizing the spirit would be revealed in their life and the spirit would come, Jesus stands up and he says in front of everyone, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture says, out of them will flow streams of living water. And John adds, by this he meant the Holy Spirit. We're going red. Code red. By this he meant the Holy Spirit, who they were to later receive. 
Jesus commandeers the event and he says it points to him and that he will give the spirit. And that water is poured out at the side of the altar. And later on in John's gospel, we see Jesus crucified and they pierce his side and out of his side flows blood and water. He is the altar of sacrifice. He is the lamb on the altar of sacrifice. Out flows two rivers, a river of blood that cleanses us from our sin and a river of water that speaks of the Holy Spirit that renews us and vivifies us and empowers us and transforms us and sets us to work in the mission of God and gives us all his royal graces. What an amazing thing. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And that river is given through Jesus by his Holy Spirit, his outgoing, outgiving self. But you know, the devil loves a desert. He might like a dessert, but he certainly loves a desert. And the devil wants to make our lives like a desert. He wants us, as it were, to be stuck in the mud with the tide out. Psalm 46 that we had read, it was Martin Luther's favorite psalm and uh, was the focus for his uh, theology. It begins talking and celebrating God as a mighty fortress. And he wrote a hymn, Ein Festerburg is unser Gott, a mighty fortress is our God. And that became the battle cry of the Reformation. That became a kind of a lifelong song. Uh, often Luther would get depressed, and when he did, he'd say, come, let us sing Psalm 46 and hide ourselves in the fortress of God. Anyway, a little while ago, I was uh, teaching in Germany, and uh, I told the translator, uh, the interpreter, I said, I'm going to speak on Psalm 46. Ein Festerburg ist unser Gott. I'm going to speak on this, and I'm going to speak on the river of God. He said, okay. Anyway, he came back up to me just before I went on, and he was all in flapping, and he said, there isn't a river. I said, what do you mean they're in the river? I just, I'm speaking on it. It's there in the scripture. It's in verse five, it's verse four. He said, it's not there. There is no river. I said, there is a river. He said, they're in a river. I said, there is a river. But there wasn't a river in his Bible. And remarkably, uh, he had one of the older translations uh, in which was based upon Luther's second set of Psalms translations and Luther had taken out the river when I got back to England I, it's one of the blessings of being in Oxford with all these smart folk I contacted the Regis professor of uh, history um, ancient history well not ancient but um it's actually early modern and modern. And uh, Lyndall Roper, and she's a Luther expert. I said, what's going on here? And she went and did some homework for me. I was very grateful. And she said, Luther at the start of his ministry had a translation of the Psalms. And in it, he said, there is a river. But in his later translation, he got rid of the German word strom, the, the flow, the current, the river. And he put in their Brunlein, which means like little springs. He lost the river. I think later on he also lost the plot a bit. He lost the river. I won't go into that. But it led him with his fortress theology and hardness into a terrible anti-Semitism. That's what I meant by lose. And when you lose the river and all you've got is the fortress, you can become really hard and brittle. Anyway, we need the river. We need the river. And there is a river. It's not just a drip. It's not just a little spring. It is a forceful current within the city of God. I don't know if you've seen the classic French film, Jean de Florette. Anyone seen that? Great. Anyone read the book? 
only a couple. I do encourage you, have a, have a go. It's absolutely brilliant. Jean de Florette, and then the, there is a sequel called Manon des Sources. Well, in Jean de Florette, a city slicker from Paris inherits a farm. And uh, when he arrives, he seeks to make a go of the farm. And he's a really smart businessman. And he thinks, um, he comes up with this plan that he's going to breed rabbits because rabbits breed rapidly. And he thinks, I can breed rabbits. We're going to have the meat. We're going to have the pelts. It's going to be absolutely brilliant. And uh, so he puts in the fence. He buys this great you know, breeding pair of rabbits. He plants these veggies to feed them and he lets the rabbits go and off they go. And soon there are rabbits everywhere. And he's feeding the rabbits with the lettuces and he's got a great big cistern and he's watering the lettuces and the rabbits are eating them and the rabbits are breeding and he's making an absolute fortune. And then a scorching summer comes and uh, drying up the ground and the water tank, the water system goes down and down and down. And then he runs out of water. The leaves, the, uh, the, the veg to feed the rabbits is withering. The rabbits are dying. And every day he gets on early morning before dawn, he gets on his donkey with pots and pans and milk churns and over the mountain he trudges and down to the other valley and he fills up a little bit of water he can get. He comes back up the mountain, back down, pours it into the cistern, but it's never enough. His effort to provide satisfaction and get water is never enough. And eventually all the crops die and all the rabbits die and he's bust and broken. Miserable story. <laughs> You've got to read the sequel. <laughs> he then turns to the occult and he goes water dousing and he's looking for water on his land and he thinks he's found it. He puts in some explosives. He lights it up. A rock shoots up with the explosion in the air. He watches it go up. He watches it come down, thwack in his temple. He drops down and he shortly die, dies shortly thereafter. I mean, what a book. What a story. Anyway, just before he dies, his last words were, I failed to see that water is the one problem. What is the one problem? And the great tragedy in the story, you'll have to read part two and I'm giving you the ending now, is that there was a river under his land all the while, but that wicked neighbors blocked it up so that his land would perish so that they could buy it on the cheap. There is a river and the enemy wants to block it up so that we do life in our own effort, in our own strength. We do ministry in our own strength. We rely on ourselves and what we can provide, getting up early, going over the mountain, down to the next valley. It's never enough. And what we need is to unblock that river and have it flow. And that's what happens in part two. Worth getting, worth watching. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And what has blocked up the river in your life? Maybe you, maybe you just got jaded. Maybe church did you in. Maybe you had a terrible experience of it. Or maybe it was temptation and you, you just sort of fell away into sin and over a while, that just put a distance between you and God. He never moves, but you moved. Maybe things got in the way of you and God. Well, it's summer. It's a great time to get right with God and to get that rubble removed and get that river flowing. I'm going to finish with this uh, story. Years ago, I was on holiday in Normandy uh, with my boys. They were younger then, little lads. And uh, one morning, uh, as we were preparing to go out for the day, I sensed the Lord say to me that he was going to speak to me. I thought, what a strange thing. The Lord has just said he's going to say something. Why doesn't he just say something? And, uh, you know, the Lord doesn't often talk to me in that kind of charismatic way, 
you know, he tends to talk to me normally uh, as I read the Bible. But I wrote it in my journal, and years later I found it, not a little while ago, and there it was. The Lord is going to speak to me today. He said so. Anyway, I went out into the day thinking, what's God going to say? And I'm looking around, expecting to see. I'm looking at my wife, seeing if there's any words written on her forehead. I'm, you know, looking at things written on the side of houses and car. I thought, Lord, what are you saying? What's the word? Anyway, we went to Mont Saint Michel. It was beautiful. And, um, uh, uh, my boy had broken his le- uh, ankle and so I had to carry him on my shoulders all the way up the, to the top and I went there was a, there was a Catholic communion service I sat in there it was lovely I brought the boy back down. I was completely exhausted by the time we got home and I hadn't heard anything I just felt shot so having carried my boy all day I said I'm just going to lie down darling do you want to just go out with the lads and uh, I lay down upstairs and um, there was a giant pond like a lake with a river flown into it in the in the jeet at the bottom of the jeet garden huge about the sort of width of this church and uh, every evening we'd go and feed the koi carp they had giant koi carp you know what I mean great big sumo carp like that 30 years old they were huge great big belly beautiful things and um, anyway I'm falling asleep when suddenly my wife shouts and she says Simon come quick there's a fish in trouble I thought what anyway I ran down and uh, ran to the bottom of um, the garden and sure enough there was a fish stuck in the mud and it was huge it was like a foot across a foot deep great big fat orange silver and black koi carp magnificent and it was dying It was suffocating because it was out of the water. And the water had just dropped. It was a very hot summer. And it had obviously swam to a part it would often swim to, only to find itself stuck in the mud and dying. And I quickly was inspired. I was inspired. I, I went all James Bond and I said to my sons, I said, you go and get me a watering can. You go and get me the dustbin lid. And they ran off and they ran back and I jumped in to the mud and I picked up this beautiful koi carp and I put it in the lid. My boy, the whole time, the other one, was watering it. And then I went around, got into the deep end, put it down and the fish came up. Said, thanks very much, mate. I said, you're welcome. And, you know, off it went. Absolutely brilliant. I turned around and as I walked back, the Lord then spoke to me and said, this is what I wanted to show you. He said that the church is like this koi carp, old and noble and beautiful, but she's left the deep end and uh, she's stuck in the mud and she needs to be put back in the deep end or else she's gonna die. And the sprinkling can of water, coming to church now and again, having a little bit of prayer now and again, that's okay. But that ain't going to keep you alive for long. What she needs is to be transplanted back into the deep end. On successive evenings, we would go out. We were there for about 10 days. That happened at the start of the holes. And every night we'd see dead koi carp. They'd gone into the muddy end and we weren't there to rescue them, and they were there dead. Beautiful, I knew they were different because mine had particular markings, and it spoke in the West Country accent. (laughs) And uh, we gotta stay in the deep end of the river of God, and he invites us all the while come further up and further in. And maybe some of you are a bit like that fat old fish, and you know that Life and the pressure of it and your experiences of late have led you to just find yourself stuck, stuck in the mud and just gasping. And tonight he wants you back in the river. And he does it. We don't need an old vicar to come and do it. He does it as we come to him, as it were the Lord Jesus picks us up and puts us back. Amen.